Hello, and welcome to the special edition of Cronkite News. I'm Chelsea Ray Banez. Thanks for joining us. Follow the money. It's a saying well used by journalists around the world, as well as our Cronkite News reporters working the business beat. Tonight, we bring you some of our top Arizona stories focused on making money, spending money, and protecting your hard-earned cash. The West Valley is giving the East Valley a run for its money, at least when it comes to new development. As Erica Arrington reports, nearly 385,000 square feet of new retail space is currently under construction, according to real estate developer CBRE Phoenix. From barren fields to cramming new storefronts into parking lots, the West Valley is booming with economic development. A resident of Sun City, Bob Kolar, says that he remembers when the West Valley was just dirt roads and farm fields. The terrain was empty around 101, pretty much. It was still farmland, and uh, then 101 opened up and it just blossomed. Along with Westgate, more entertainment options are going in, like Top Golf and the expansion of the Desert Diamond Casino and Resort. Sintra Hoffman, president and CEO of Westmark, says the West Valley can be a one-stop shop for future occupants. We really see ourselves as a very uh, all, much all-inclusive community where we have everything to offer. Here in the West Valley, it's hard to find a corner that isn't under construction. As you can see behind me, this retail center is being built that will include a Starbucks, frozen yogurt munchies, raising canes, and also a Tokyo Joe's. Another addition to the West Valley is the new PV303, a 1,600-acre industrial business park that is right off the 303 in Goodyear. Sun City resident Kolar is excited this new development isn't in his backyard. It's, it's going to keep those people from shopping over here. With the expansion of retail and entertainment growth, hopefully for Kolar, more people will have other options for shopping, work, and play. In the West Valley, Erica Arrington, Cronkite News. Strong population and job growth, according to CBRE, gives a positive outlook for the Phoenix retail market for the rest of 2017. Park Central Mall, Phoenix's first large-scale shopping mall, is on the verge of a transformation. Holly Bach finds out what the future could look like for this space. I think it's going to turn into the hip, cool new place to hang out. Two real estate companies, Plaza Companies and Halua Loa Companies, recently bought 337,000 square feet of Park Central Mall in hopes of reviving the area near Central and Osborne. Park Central will once again be the glorious hub it once was. The mall originally started on 46 acres of land and opened in 1957 in Uptown Phoenix. It housed major department stores such as Goldwaters and Diamonds. As those stores closed, the mall became more of a business center, but those large trees and shady areas we remember will remain. We will be creating a number of indoor outdoor spaces where people can gather, where they can connect, where they can meet to talk about business opportunities, to enjoy the environment. The two real estate companies will be renovating this area you see right behind me to turn it into a more creative and versatile environment for visitors, workers and their employers. The plans preserve the mid-century modern architecture and open space with the high ceilings and a variety of exposed roof structures, retail shopping, and restaurants. By next summer, it'll be you know shaded outdoor landing space with cool restaurants. So I think it will see the first tenants move in certainly within the next six to eight months. Uh, into the space. Harper says they're still working on filling the spaces with tenants. In Phoenix, Holly Bach, Cronkite News. Construction for Park Central will start this December and it's set to be finished next fall. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton proclaimed October 11th, 2017 as Diversity Employment Day. Reporter Nicole Gutierrez attended a career fair today where she spoke to employers and attendees about the importance of having a diverse workforce. The 17th Annual Diversity Employment Day Career Fair targets candidates of all classes and backgrounds with the purpose of adding diversity and awareness in the workforce. I spoke to employers and attendees on what the mutual opportunities are of having inclusive business. This is a great example that things 
can be possible, that there is a lot of uh, opportunities for everyone. The 17th Annual Diversity Employment Day Career Fair encouraged people of diverse backgrounds to come find a new job. This brings about the importance of the diversity in the workplace. A lot of companies also uh, do need to do specific outreach for diversity as well as uh, to be able to fill diversity initiatives which are required for some of them. The career fair is open to anyone and is a free of charge. Attendees just pick up a form and fill out what their recent work is, their education, and what type of position they're looking for. Attendees like Dallas Diaz has past experience working in an environment that's inclusive and innovative. That's why she was here, specifically taking interest in the employers at the fair. And when you level out the playing field in your organization to give anybody a chance despite where they come from, just based on their skills and their knowledge and their passion to do the job right or to help other people, I think it really shows. With more than 20 employers recruiting, the Jewish Family and Children's Service is one example of an employer that believes their diverse staff is key to keeping clients satisfied while promoting unity. It's very important with our clients that we meet with. Uh, we are looking for individuals that are bilingual um, as well as part of our com community and that are able to assist our clients that we serve. It helps our clients also relate to our staff which promotes unity within our group and helps us help them. Darlene Enfield, coordinator of the fair, says the value of this event is to bring a diversity of opinions from attendees to potential employers. May 17, 2018 will be the next annual Employment Day Career Fair in Phoenix. In the Broadcast Center, Nicole Gutierrez, Cronkite News. Native American communities are looking into other revenue opportunities besides gaming. Reporter Emily Richardson was at the National Indian Gaming Association's Mid-Year Expo, where the idea of getting into the cannabis business was addressed. Today in downtown Phoenix, Native Americans from across the nation came together to discuss ways to help their communities. One item discussed, whether the cannabis business could potentially help tribes' economies. Everything that you've read about this industry has been wrong. Now that marijuana in some form is legal in 29 states in the District of Columbia, tribal communities are considering expanding their business into cannabis. Two already have. This afternoon in Phoenix, Chairman Bill Sterud of the Peelup Tribe and David Villapondo of the Pay Nation discussed how cannabis is helping their communities. Sterud's tribe is in Washington and they sell medical and recreational marijuana to tribal and non-tribal citizens. He says that even though there have been revenue benefits for his tribe, he believes that the most important part of cannabis is its medical use. The revenue is good. The medicinal powers of cannabis can't be underestimated. It's been nothing but good in my mind. It's medicine and you you got to give your people medicine if they need it. On the other hand, Villa Pondo's tribe in Southern California is only interested in being involved with medical marijuana. Uh, San Isabel is a very conservative general membership, uh, and while the general membership recognizes the medical efficacy of cannabis products, um, they are not in favor of recreational. Both men agree that the cannabis industry can provide good opportunities for tribal communities. The buzz around tribal marijuana started in December of 2014 when the federal government announced it would permit American Indian communities to grow and sell cannabis. In Arizona, there are 22 federally recognized tribes. In 2011, the Arizona Department of Health Services published a report where they said tribal leaders and representatives in attendance of their medical marijuana tribal consultation expressed unified opposition to the medical marijuana law. Since then, none have said if they are planning on venturing into the cannabis industry. However, according to Villa Pondo, as the nation begins to be more supportive of marijuana, tribal communities will most likely follow behind. Well, I think in general in society, tribes are a reflection of uh, society's norms. Uh, and the pendulum is swinging towards acceptance. Marijuana still isn't legal federally, so tribal marijuana is dependent on state laws. In Phoenix, Emily Richardson, Cronkite News. Phoenix Children's Hospital just completed a $40 million renovation. Nikirika Omarenye talked to employees to find out what the public can expect. Phoenix Children's Hospital will open a new emergency department later this month. This is a great thing for our hospital and our community as this will give us an opportunity to um, continue to care for the sickest children in Arizona and to 
take care of more children at the same time. Plans for the new emergency department, or ED, have been ongoing for the past five years. The hospital raised $40 million for the project in 2015, and more space has been the most crucial improvement. There are 63 exam rooms, three procedure rooms, and six trauma bays, which is way larger than what they are today. The old emergency department was built to treat about 30,000 patients, which wasn't enough for the 80,000 patients who actually came through. When we have backup in our current uh, ED over there, people leave. And so it's not serving the community. And we want all the kiddos to come here and be served. And that's our main focus. With the new addition, 80 to 100,000 kids a year will be able to come through the only level one pediatric trauma center in Arizona. This comes just in time to accommodate the state's growing child population. You know, we're looking at probably adding another 500,000 to a million children over the next five to six years. And so those are children that need to be seen and need to have health care. One of the best benefits of the new location of the ED is the proximity to the helipad. Patients will come down this elevator and walk only two minutes as opposed to what took five minutes before. And every minute counts in a trauma situation. In Phoenix, I'm in Kirko Marinette, Cronkite News. The emergency department will officially open its doors to the public on September 20th. Early Friday morning, a wrong way crash on I-10 near 19th Avenue injured seven people. That's just the latest in a string of crashes. Since January, Arizona Department of Public Safety officers have responded to nearly 1,200 wrong way driver calls, and 14 people have died in accidents. But as April Morganroth shows us, there is training to help drivers react to and avoid wrong way drivers. Wrong way driver. Yeah. If we introduce them to a lifetime of horrible events that could potentially happen out there. Hopefully they will never encounter them, but if they do, they have a recall. Of Maria and Richard Wojcik created this simulator to help drivers learn what to do if a wrong way driver comes barreling toward the user. Your immediate reaction is to stop. And in most cases, putting your foot on the brake is the wrong answer. The right answer is to see the danger as early as possible. Listen to the traffic around you. For every minute or mile, it's best to check your rear view mirror and to your left and right for three seconds. It's eye movement and eye lead time, how much you're looking out, out and then how much you're looking around you. So it's an actual uh, way in which to scan your environment. But for the best prevention, DPS said there's a lane drivers should avoid, especially late at night. Statistics have shown and studies have shown that wrong way drivers tend to stay on what they believe is their right hand side. So as they're driving the wrong way, they're actually driving generally in the HOV lane, uh, which would be your left hand lane. Director Alberto Gutierrez at Arizona Governor's Office of Highway Safety said, technology can decrease the number of wrong way crashes. We need to look at everything in our all that can reduce that incidence. And the governor was very clear to us uh, on a direct order saying, find a way to reduce the number of wrong way driver crashes. Both Lee and Gutierrez say they are open to creative solutions from the public. In Phoenix, April Morganroth, Cronkite News. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. Could you imagine taking all of your belongings and moving into a space with less than 350 square feet? Microhousing is an emerging trend that began in dense places like New York and San Francisco. But as reporter Tim Johns recently discovered, it's starting to make its way here to the valley. James Smith may be taller than most people at six foot six, but there's nothing particularly big about his apartment. Smith lives in a micro apartment complex called Whitestone Studios in downtown Phoenix. And for him, it's the perfect size. It can be quite limiting in what you fill your space with, but I think that's a wonderful challenge that people need to be faced with. And Smith is not alone. Microhousing is becoming a bigger trend for house hunters nationwide for a variety of reasons. 
Residents cite things such as lower rent and utility bills, less maintenance, and simpler living as some of the perks of living in a micro unit. Christoph Kaiser is an architect and developer who has been following the trend of microhomes for several years. Kaiser believes that the trend is starting to make its way into the valley too, with a handful of projects being built or proposed in recent years. He says it's being driven by a resurgence of people looking to live in an increasingly vibrant downtown Phoenix. Similar to what's happening globally in other international cities is happening in Phoenix where people want to be downtown to be downtown. And for Smith, he welcomes this trend to his native city and hopes it's something that continues to grow. I think it will, definitely, as more and more people sort of introduce themselves to the idea and become more familiar with it and comfortable with it. I think it's something that could be quite successful. In Phoenix, Tim Johns, Cronkite News. The apartments at Whitestone Studios comes fully furnished and rent starts at about $1,300 per month. Some consider the arts a luxury, but to the city of Phoenix, they're much more than that. And Kira Camarigny looked into the industry that contributes millions of dollars and thousands of jobs to the economy. Lots of very beautiful paintings, uh, statues. A day at the museum. I think probably the most interesting to me were the old artifacts. William Harshman is one of many people who spend his time and money at local art exhibits. Today, his spending is directly to the museum. So far, just the admission. But Scottsdale Museum of the West director and CEO Mike Fox says that oftentimes, visitors spend money on more than just tickets, called indirect spending. They buy dinners before or after the event. They pay for... Uh, baby care. A recent report reveals that the arts generated over $400 million in 2015, up from $300 million in 2012. The study, conducted by Americans for the Arts, looks at the economic impact of nonprofit culture organizations and their audiences in cities across the country. The findings of the report were presented at the Building a Prosperous Phoenix Through the Arts event, where Mayor Greg Stanton spoke about how the arts even affects his job. The arts make a city in so many ways. I can't recruit great businesses to Phoenix if we're not in a fun, interesting place to live. The report also stated that the industry supports over 12,000 jobs in the city. This includes any job that contributes to the experience, such as performers, exhibit workers, and even valet parkers. It's a phenomenal uh, ripple effect throughout our communities because what do they do with their money? They go and they spend it. In Scottsdale, in Kiriko Marinia, Cronkite News. The study also shows that these results are not strictly local. The arts industry generated over $160 billion nationally in 2015. College dormitories have come a long way in recent years, with universities spending millions of dollars to integrate them with the latest technologies. ASU's brand new engineering dorm, Tooker House, is no exception. Tim John shows us why even big tech companies are providing their latest gadgets to students who live there. Carter Kwan is an engineering student who just started his junior year at ASU. Kwan is also one of the first residents to live in Tooker House, one of America's most technologically advanced dorms. This new building is amazing. There's nothing quite like it in the country. Tooker House, which just opened last month, features things such as classroom workspaces, 3D printers, and Bluetooth-enabled washer and dryers. The high-tech dorm has garnered so much attention that even the tech giants of the corporate world have begun to take notice. Amazon has donated 1,600 of their Echo Dots for use by the residents of Tooker House, and there's a reason why. James Colafello, an associate dean at the Fulton Schools of Engineering, says it's because engineering graduates are in such high demand and that companies are keen to get in front of them as potential employers. Companies understand that if they want to be able to hire our students, they can't wait until they're seniors. And so we have companies getting involved with the students as early as a freshman year, uh, trying to get their brand out there. Alexa. And it seems to be working. Kwan, along with his friend and classmate Stephen Hall, have already begun developing new interfaces for their Echo Dots and cite Amazon as a potential dream employer. Oh, I'd love to work at Amazon, so Amazon, if you watch it. <laughs> but in the meantime, Tooker House, with all its gadgets, will continue to be Kwan's home. In Tempe, Tim Johns, Cronkite News. Tucker House is home to nearly 1,600 students and is located on University Drive on ASU's Tempe campus. The recent AZ Pure Water Brew Challenge gave breweries across the state the task of making the best tasting beer with one common element. 
wastewater. And Kurika Amarinier talked to consumers about what they thought about this concept. I love it. I feel good about that. It doesn't phase me. These consumers are talking about the concept of using treated wastewater to make beer. We should be using wastewater more appropriately everywhere, and uh, it shouldn't affect the taste. I, I actually had somebody say, wastewater beer, wastewater water. And I'm like, I can't tell the difference. Mother Bunch Brewery in Phoenix recently participated in the AZ Pure Water Challenge, where over 20 breweries competed to see who can make the best tasting beer with treated wastewater. Joel Omar Zamora, head brewer at Mother Bunch, got 500 gallons of the water for the contest. It was a little bit softer, it was a little bit easier to follow on. Because city water is a little bit harder, it's a little bit more, more work to get it to where you want it. His work in creating the beer is paying off. It's been sound like hotcakes. Lead bartender at Mother Bunch, Marco Hernandez, says by law he has to let customers know about the wastewater beer, but says the response has been overwhelmingly positive. I'd say about 90% receptive. However, he says that with the positive reaction, every once in a while, he'll hear opinions from jokesters. I get a lot of uh, poop water jokes. Joe Sirio, water services superintendent for the city of Phoenix, has also heard his share of doubts from consumers. It's dirty going out, I would say that's a misconception. I mean, it's pretty clean by the time you get done treating it. Once the water goes through this treatment process, it is now considered reclaimed, which is not quite yet safe for drinking, but can be purified and used in the beer or this water, which cereal says is just as clean as any water on the market. Experts predict this practice will only become more prevalent in the future. In Phoenix, in Kirko Marina, Cronkite News. This is one bartender you don't have to tip. Cronkite News reporter Tim Johns was in Scottsdale to see how automation is affecting the restaurant and bartending business. This is Sorso Wine Room in Scottsdale Quarter, and this is its automated wine dispenser. Sorso's co-owner Mark Tian says he was on vacation with his wife in Italy after retiring from professional baseball when he first came across this type of technology. We didn't have much experience with Italian wine, so we really enjoyed our experience of going through and, and tasting a bunch of different varietals. Um, so ultimately when we decided to go down the path of opening a wine bar, this idea was kind of the center of that. And it's not just Sorso. Automated alcohol dispensers are popping up all over the valley and across the country. Market Watch says that bartending could be the next job to become automated. Many establishments cite things such as time, money, and efficiency as some of the reasons why they're choosing to go automated. It's quicker for consumers, but will consumers miss that interaction with their friendly neighborhood barkeep? Joey Mills Villegas, the general manager at Sorso, says they're still keeping that personal connection. I think people do go out for conversation and human interaction. I think people could just cook at home if they wanted to avoid it that much. Since right now the automated machines only dispense wine and beer, not being able to provide mitt drinks are often mentioned as one of the drawbacks of automated bartenders. But being able to get yourself a glass of cheap Chardonnay without the bartender looking down his nose at you could be priceless. In Scottsdale, Tim Johns, Cronkite News. Source's automated wine dispenser has 32 wines from around the world for customers to choose from. A popular bar in Tempe is cleaning house this weekend. And as Sydney Eisenberg reports, those who frequented Minderbinders may have a chance to own a piece of the past. How you doing? Eric Hoyer is the owner of EJ's Auction and Consignment Store. His most recent task, to sell the remnants of beloved bar, Minderbinders. You know, they had things up in the ceiling that weighed five, six, seven, eight hundred pounds. We had to take out walls uh, to get things out because it was so large. It was a bittersweet job for Hoyer. Uh, this was just how it was. In fact, I probably went into, into Minderbinder dressed like that, yahoo there. Um, well, maybe not. My shorts were probably a lot shorter back then. We would float the, the, the salt on a Saturday, uh, get done, and we'd be starving and ready to start drinking, drinking, I guess, back in those days. So we'd head to Minder Binders. Now, while Minder Binder itself may be gone, the history of Minder Binder has not been hung up. We are keeping some of the things there. Uh, we probably are keeping 5% of the items, items that we thought were really cool and that made sense for our concept. The social hall will now take the place of Minder Binders on University and McClintock. Kenny expects to open in about a month or two. However, Hoyer feels nostalgic about his time at that eclectic bar. When I was young, 
I uh, would have never ever thought I would have been the one that represented selling uh, all of the stuff in there. Uh, so it's kind of a cool feeling for me. It brings back some great memories. Uh, and it's a little sad to see some of this stuff go. In Glendale, Sydney Eisenberg, Cronkite News. The items from Minder Binder will be auctioned off this Saturday. Nail art is now a multi-million dollar business with its popularity soaring. Reporter Tim Johns introduces us to one Valley Nail technician has been at the forefront of cashing and in on this colorful trend. It's art that fits on your fingertips. In just a few years, Sarah Waite has made a name for herself as one of Phoenix's top nail artists. The Valley native founded Chalkboard Nails, a blog and social media accounts that have amassed hundreds of thousands of followers who want to see what she creates next. I co-authored a book with some other bloggers called Pretty Hands and Sweet Feet. Um, I judged a competition for Sally Hansen in New York City. Uh, I've been on TV. All this attention has allowed Waite to promote her brand and expand her audience. But it's not just Waite who's been riding the nail art wave. According to NailsMag.com, nail art has exploded in the past decade. Nail art now makes up 12% of the total number of services done in salons nationwide. And nail art pictures are among the top five most tagged items on both Instagram and Pinterest. Erin Bauer is one of Waite's clients. She says it's easy for her to see why people have fallen in love with this trend. For me, it's a way to express myself. Um, it's just more fun than a plain color on my nails. And for weight, that form of individual self-expression is what it's all about. Try something out and maybe push yourself a little bit style-wise and see if you like that vibe. And then, you know, if you don't, it comes off. But no matter where this trend goes next, there's no doubt that weight will continue to nail it. In Phoenix, Tim Johns, Cronkite News. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of Cronkite News. For more multimedia coverage, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org and click on the Money tab.